So um, two weeks ago, I gave you a definition for uh, boundaries, and it talked about boundaries as the lines that we draw, the lines that we draw in our life that allow the right things to, to, stay, to stay in and keep the wrong things out. So today we're gonna talk about the right things on the inside of you, because here's the thing. If you don't have the right things spiritually, if you don't have the right things on the inside of you, it's like living with an enemy that resides inside of you. So if you put the wrong things on the inside, it will sabotage your life over and over and over again. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what we need on the inside to be able to love really well. And some of these things are things that you hear, but we don't really appropriate for ourselves. And so let's take a look at the passage, Colossians chapter three, verse 12 says it like this. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. The first thing I want you to see about this passage is that he's not, he's not uh, basically saying to us, you need to do these morally right things. You need to have compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. He's saying that when you have the right things on the inside of you, these are things that will naturally flow out of a life that is well-loved. You see, when you are loved well by God, it becomes easier for you to love other people well. But if you've never experienced that before, it makes it more difficult for you because all you have, like I did, the background that you grew up in, which is largely probably dysfunctional. Maybe a few of you guys grew up in the you know, perfect kind of scenario, but for most of us, we had kind of backgrounds that were really messed up. And we learned to put things on the inside of us when we were young that we need to just basically extricate from our life. There are a couple of things here, so let's dive into them. There are three things that we must know before we can love others well. The first thing is you are chosen. The first thing is you are chosen, okay? You're chosen. What does that mean? Well, I think like for, if you've been a Christian your whole life, you dive into things like Calvinism and Arminianism and all, what does all that mean? He's not writing that theologically. What he's writing here is pastorally. He's saying that you need to realize something on the deep core inside of who you are that you were chosen. And and that chosenness happened a long time before you had an encounter with God. See, it's not that somebody shared Christ with you like they did with me and you became a follower of Jesus. The reality is God was working a plan from a long, long time ago that that plan would lead to your salvation and you're coming into a relationship with him. And there's nothing that hell could do to stop it. There's nothing that anyone could do to stop it because God always initiates a relationship with us. Like for example, if you're here right now and you're like, somebody brought me to church, they said it was good, you know, we're gonna come and listen. I don't know what I believe about God. I would just tell you this, that if you have spiritual curiosity right now, that's because God is stirring in your heart. Prior to being a Christian, growing up with parents that weren't Christians, grandparents that weren't Christians, I never thought about God. It's not like we hated him because we never thought about him. It's like thinking about the Easter bunny. You just don't, except for like one day a year. You just don't. And so for us, that's, that's what that was like until it wasn't when God came right into my life at this moment. But it wasn't that moment that he decided, I choose Mike or I choose you. The Bible teaches us something much, much further and much more comprehensive and much more beautiful. It says it like this, Ephesians 1, 4. For he chose us in him. For God the Father chose us to have a relationship with him before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. That's a powerful thing. You see, before he flung the universe, all the galaxies of the universe into existence, before through his spoken word, he created all that is, matter, reality, everything. Before he did that, he thought about you. And one of the implications about being chosen that I don't wanna skip by real fast today is not only that you were chosen, but you were wanted. You were wanted. And I think every one of us has gone through something in our life where we did not feel wanted. We felt like we were on the outside, the relationship broke, there was betrayal, something took place, and we just, and in the middle of all of our deepest fears about not being enough, somebody validated those fears and said, nah, and they pushed us away. That's a human experience. That's not just something that happens to some people, it happens to all of us at some point or another in our life. And I want you to remember what that was like to feel that, to experience that. That's a terrible, that's a terrible emotion. It's a terrible set of experiences that can scar you for a long time. But behind all of those circumstances, behind all of those feelings, there was the God who created the heavens and the earth. He had already thought of you and he already had a plan for you and he chose you because he wanted you. And I need you to hear today, he still wants you. And you're like, Pastor Mike, I don't know. I don't know. Like, 
you don't know the things that I do. Well, I do because I did some of those things. Okay, you are chosen, you are wanted. And let's take a look at the second thing that you need to do, you need to know to be able to care for other people well and love them well. The second one, you're holy. And you go, now I'm out. Okay, all right, so, so chosen, okay, that feels good. I like that, I like the, I like the fact that I'm wanted, but you don't know me, man. I like, I, the thing Saturday, I mean, whoo, Saturday night was crazy. I, I get it, uh, I've lived that, first of all. And so, so we're not casting stones at anyone, but, but really the reason why you feel like you're not holy is because you have a twisted up understanding of what holiness is. Holiness is not based upon your behavior. Your behavior is an effect of holiness in your life. And so when you understand the gospel that Jesus died, he does these two things for us on the cross, two things. It's called double imputation in theology. What happens on, he's dying on the cross, he's, he's hanging there and, and he screams out, Elohai, Elohai, Lamaz, Bathani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The father turns his face away. What's happening in that moment? It's the hardest thing Jesus goes through. It wasn't the beatings, it wasn't any of that other stuff. It was the moment where the father turns his face that he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God through Christ. He turns away because of these two things. Number one, all of our sin is placed on Jesus on the cross. And then he turns back around and he places righteousness inside of us, holiness inside of us. And so when he looks down from heaven, he doesn't see all the brokenness and the sinfulness. He sees the blood of Jesus Christ covering over your whole life. And I just want you to understand that because when you understand that, it changes how you feel like you have to perform. Because the reality is some of you are religious, but you have no relationship with Jesus. And I know that you're religious because you feel this impulse towards God because that's, that's where we're, we're created in his image. We're drawn to him, even if we're not Christian. But the deal is, he's not in the background counting your good deeds as you pile them one on top of the next so that one day he'll look down, the great sky king will look down from heaven and go, look what she did, look what he did. No, the Bible says that our deeds are like filthy rags. They don't count, they don't work. And here's the beautiful thing about that is that once you realize that, you stop performing for everyone around you. When you realize that you've been accepted that when the father looks down, not only, not only did he choose you, not only were you wanted, but you're fully accepted. And the only way for him to accept us is that the blood of Christ covers over our life. It is a powerful life-changing kind of principle. So I have this granddaughter, uh, her name's Laura. <laughs> oh my gosh. She, 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 is, she, is, she is so beautiful. Her name is Jordan. And, and she just, all she does is lay there. She just lays there with her mouth open. And I die. She's so much better than my kids. I mean, so much better. Like, I just, I love her so much. And I know, I know, like, I know that, like, one day she's gonna grow up and be a sinner. Like, I know she's gonna make bad choices and there'll be boys and just, ah! It's just not, but right now I look at her, I'm just like, oh. And I think that's how the father looks at us when the blood of Jesus covers us. He says, look at my son. And, and I know he does some things. And I know, that, I, know that, and I know that he needs to change. I know she needs to change, but look at her. She's beautiful, she's holy in my sight. When you begin to understand that the gift of God is that he makes you right with God and that that now changes your motivation for doing all the things. I don't have to perform for God, but I want to because I love him but I'm also not having to perform for anyone else. And this is something that once you put this, if boundaries are putting the right things on the inside and putting the wrong things on the outside, keeping the wrong things on the outside, if you don't have the right things on the inside, it's like living with an enemy inside. And so if you're living with a performance mentality that God can only be happy with me when I'm doing X, Y, and Z, that's problematic because not only will it limit your ability to love, but it'll limit your ability to be loved because you'll not just take that with your relationship with God, you'll take it into your relationship with your wife. You'll take it into your relationship with everyone else. Why? Because I'm not okay. But once you realize you're okay because of what Jesus did for you, now you can give yourself fully to the other person. And now you don't have to have an expectations of the other person. Jerry Maguire, that was the worst theology in the history of mankind. She does not complete you. Like that's not a thing. In fact, that's codependent, weird narcissism. You need to realize, you need to realize like when you place all of your expectations on the other person, it's because you feel incomplete inside. But in Christ, the 
holiness that is yours is the approval of the Father who looks down from heaven and goes, look at him, look at her. I love them with all my heart. Colossians 3, 12 through 17, therefore, as God's chosen people, you were chosen because you were wanted. You were chosen because you were wanted. You are holy and you are sanctified. You're dearly loved. Let's take a look at this. His moral goodness transferred to our account. The third thing that you need to know is this. You're loved. You go, yeah, 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 I know. For God to love the world. No, no. God loves you, specifically you. And if you look at that passage up there, let's look at the passage. Therefore, it's God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Not just a little bit, but thoroughly loved. You are completely loved. And and dearly loved means there's an intensity to that love because the love is so complete, he can't actually love you more tomorrow than he does today. That's the thing about God's love. It is absolutely perfect. Our love comes and goes with people. I, I love you more sometimes and I love you less other times right? It just comes and goes, but, but not with the father. With the father, he looks down, he sees Jesus's blood covering over your life. He looks at you and he says, I love you so much. I can't actually love you more tomorrow. His love is perfect. And one of the things that challenges us with that is that we see our own brokenness and we see our own sinfulness and we see our own rebellion. And we go, you can't possibly, you can't possibly love it. And you know how we feel? We feel like that weird uncle or aunt that you might have. You're like, I have to love them but I don't like them a whole lot, right? You don't want to be around them. And I think sometimes that's how we feel when we fall and fail. When we fall and fail, we look at, each, we look at God and we go, I know he loves me because he has to, but I don't know if he really likes me a whole lot. And then we find a verse like this. Therefore, as God's chosen people who are wanted, you are holy, you are approved, and you're loved thoroughly. When you're loved thoroughly, you have the ability to love others better. When you can't experience that love from the Father, and if you've never appropriated that degree of love on the inside, and I don't think any of us have done this perfectly, but if you constantly run around thinking he accepts me because he has to, and I want you to understand, there's nothing in the Bible that says God has to love you. Not one verse. It just means that he does. And he loves you with all of his heart, not just a part of it. Just as he asks us to love him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, he says, I want you to love me in the same way because I love you that way. And look at what it says, Colossians 3, 12 through 17. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And, and I think, like, what is this phrase clothe here? What does that mean, okay? Okay, let's talk about it. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So I've got to, I've got to go to a wedding. I don't have to. I, I get to go to a wedding in, in, uh, in December. And I've, it's in Texas. And uh, I have known this girl since she was, I've known her parents, but I've known her since she was one years old when she hung out with my oldest little boy in a crib. Uh, and they just, they're, they're great folks. But I, and I've done, I don't do a ton of weddings anymore. I got all kinds of pastors now that love to do that and do it better than I do. But I would say that... Uh, the worst part of this wedding is I have to wear a tuxedo. I mean, a tuxedo. I've done weddings for 30 years and I, no one's ever said, hey, and we need you to be in a tux. It's just not been a thing. It's not, it doesn't happen very often, but I gotta, and I hate it. I don't wanna look like a penguin. Like, I'm telling you, like, seriously, like the last time I wore a tuxedo was prom. Prom. It was powder blue, white cummerbund. Woo, it was fire. Pastor Mike looked good. Yeah, it was good. So we had, I was, that was fun. Wonder, I don't want to do it. But if I decided, like, I'll just come the way I'm comfortable, I'd come with jeans and sneakers and a T-shirt. That sounds good. But it wouldn't be because I wouldn't be dressing for the occasion. I'd be dishonoring everyone around me to do so. And when Paul uses this language, he's basically saying this, that you have to dress for the right occasion. You've got to know that when you're talking to someone else, that you've got, to, you've got to know when it's appropriate for you to be compassionate or kind or humble or gentle and patient. Clothe yourself with these things. Put these things on in the right circumstances in the right time. And one of the best ways that you're gonna love other people is know what they need in that moment. You have to be a student of everyone around you, the people that you love especially. And the more that you're a student of people, you'll know, does he need compassion right now or does he need challenge? Compassion's wonderful, but some of you are just all compassion. It doesn't matter. You're like, I killed somebody. You're like, that's a shame. 
I feel bad for you, man. Like, no, 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 like sometimes someone needs to be told, hey, get up and stop wallowing. You know that wallowing is like one of the worst things you can do? There's nothing psychologically healthy about just going, poor me. You can feel your feelings, you can go through a process, you can mourn, you can grieve, but when you wallow, you stay in a state of like just unhealth, dis-ease. And he's like, I want you to clothe yourself with the right knowledge to be able to speak into a person's life with the right situation at the right time. Clothe yourself, wear the right clothes, the right situation. Honor the person who is in front of you. And he goes on, we have to dress for the right occasion. Verse 13, here's what we have to do because sometimes relationships are messy. Bear with each other, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has grievance against someone else, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Let's, let's talk about what, what does this mean, bear with someone else? When you're bearing with someone else, you're not, uh, you're not in alignment with the person. So what this says is basically, if we were to rewrite this in the way that it's meant to be, bear it with each other means get through it with them. Get through it with them, okay? Get through it with them. And by the way, forgive one another. So if you need to be forgiven, ask for forgiveness. And there are people in the room right now that absolutely need to ask for forgiveness, but your heart is hardened towards a person right now. And you need to humble yourself because you need to dress for the occasion. You need to say, I'm gonna humble myself before this person and it's gonna feel bit weird and scary and it's, and it, and it's risky because they might not respond well to it. But at the end of the day, you're not responsible for someone else's response to your humility. You're responsible for humility, for loving them well. And if they don't receive it, that's not on you, that's on them. Bear with each other and forgive each other. And so if they need to ask forgiveness of you, you have to, you're, you're gonna forgive one another uh, if any of you has a grievance. So let's talk about grievance for a second. There are just some of us that walk around with a grievance mindset all the time. You're always looking for the problems around. And there's no shortage of doing that on social media. You can get on social media and they'll tell you 25 or 30 things in 10 minutes that are wrong or that you need in your life to make yourself okay. This is just how the algorithms work today. But it's not just that. It's, it's media on television. It's what you listen to. It's podcasts galore that are all over the place. I want you to realize there's all kinds of things in your life outside the church that are pointing you to be afraid, be worried, be scared. Can I just say there's also, if you cultivate it, the mindset not of grievance, but of gratitude. I'm gonna hit that at the very last point of our message. But I want you to know that you can train your brain to look for the negatives or you can train your brain to look for positive and beautiful things. Guys, there's so much right now. I mean, did you drive on a road here? I mean, we're in air conditioning. It's Florida. I thank God for the carrier family every single day. Can you imagine we're just sweating in here? It's terrible, right? He vented the air conditioning, just so you know. All right, so... so but, but I mean, think about it. Like, do you, I mean, you drove here. I'm, I'm assuming you didn't come in your buggy, right? You, you came in a car, right? Maybe it had air conditioning, maybe it didn't, okay. But whatever, like you came here. We assemble in a place where we're not publicly scared to do so as followers of Jesus. We have all kinds of amazing, we didn't wake up this morning wondering if a bomb was gonna land in our house. No one shot at you on the way over. And everyone's like, oh, the world's falling apart. It's not. It's not falling apart. Are there bad things? Sure. But guess what? The world has always had bad things. There's always been political division. There's always been hard times. The only time that wasn't the case was 1950 to 1951. Okay? That's probably it. That's it. But the rest of it, we've always had these things. The question is, where is your mind? The question is, where is your mind? So you can bear with each other and you can forgive each other, but don't be a person who's constantly looking around for grievances. If someone has to ask your forgiveness for you being offended at every little thing in your life, they're gonna leave you. They're gonna be out of, <laughs> amen, someone said. <laughs> That's a hard person to be around. Don't be a person who's easily offended. Let's easily offended. Don't be a person who's easily offended, right? But if you have to ask forgiveness, ask forgiveness. If someone has to ask forgiveness, your job is to forgive them. Forgive as God forgave you. I think this is probably the most powerful part of this message. It sets a huge standard in your life. Maybe you ask around and you ask yourself the question, how do I forgive this person? God, I don't want to forgive this person. And the Bible says, forgive as God forgave you. So maybe we ask ourselves, how has God dealt with me in this area of my life? How has he forgiven me for these same kinds of things? See, I think forgiveness doesn't start with the other person. It starts and ends with you. If you first ask yourself, God, how have you dealt with me in this? 
Well, they've done it to me five times. Have I done it to you five times? Yeah, I have. And you've forgiven me, you've given me grace, you've given me mercy, you've done it over and over again. All right, so maybe I need to forgive. And then again, forgiveness begins and ends with you. It's not contingent. Your forgiveness is not contingent upon them changing their behavior. Guys, listen, I really want you to think about this for a second. If it depends upon, if your forgiveness of someone else depends upon them changing their behavior, they own you. Instead, we ask forgiveness or we forgive them. And if they be change or not, that's on them. That's what they have to deal with God. But you get set free when you forgive in that way. So we forgive the way that the Lord has forgiven us. But I think there is a problem in this. And that is we have a defective view of God's love up on the screen. We don't feel like we're dearly loved. And because of that, we don't feel forgiven. And the way that I like to talk about this is I talk about it as like an orphan spirit. I don't mean a demon, anything like that. I just mean like an orphan mindset. For some of us, we just kind of have that mindset and it can evolve from all kinds of families of origin circumstances. Mine was, my father was a violent alcoholic. My parents weren't Christian. My grandparents, we didn't have religion growing up. It wasn't a thing. And I will tell you that growing up in that way, I constantly would have to say to myself, you gotta take care of yourself because no one here is gonna take care of you. My father was that guy. My mother was just trying to make it through a very horrible marriage through that time. And she was just trying to do the best that she could, but she was absent. So it was like up to me to be able to make sure that I was okay. And the problem with that is that if you're not a follower of Jesus, you may actually be in that situation. You may just be on your own. You have that kind of orphan mindset. The problem with that is that when you become a follower of Jesus though, and you carry an orphan mindset into your relationship with God, you're discounting all the things that we just talked about. The fact that God considered you from the, before the foundation of the earth. In the moments before your salvation, God was already knowing that you and him would have a relationship one day that would be amazing and incredible. I want you to recognize that when you walk around with the orphan mindset, here's what happens inside your heart. You say to yourself, I'm on my own. And what you say to yourself and how the standard that you hold to yourself is the standard you'll hold outside yourself as well. What you put on the inside of your boundaries here will be what you expect on the outside of your boundaries out here. So if I think to myself, I'm just an orphan, I'm on my own, I gotta make sure everything works myself, I'm not gonna lean into Jesus. I'm gonna work towards self-sufficiency. And I'm gonna throw a bomb on, the, on you guys right now. Self-sufficiency, though American quality, self-sufficiency is an anti-biblical idea. We are supposed to walk in dependence upon the Father. We are to walk in fellowship with the Spirit. We don't do things on our own. My righteousness, your righteousness is not our own. It's his. And because of that, and because of that, we can be the people that he wants us to be. But if you are walking around with an orphan spirit saying to yourself, man, I gotta make sure I'm right with everything, then you're gonna do the same thing to other people. When someone comes to you and says, I need forgiveness, you're gonna go, why, man? I did this. Why can't you do this? I, I'm, I figured it out. Why can't you figure it out? I'm not gonna give you forgiveness. Get out of here. On the other hand, if you recognize and have the humility to recognize the brokenness inside of you, the twisted up nature of our hearts and our minds sometimes, when someone comes and they say, hey, I really screwed up, in the background, you can go, yeah, I've done that too. I've messed that up before. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry I was not wanting to forgive you. I, I forgive you. And you work towards that. Forgiveness is never a single act. It is an act, especially the deeper the pain, it's an act that happens over and over and over and over again. Because you know what? We forgive and then we pick it up again. We forgive and we pick it up again until one day we drop it once and for all. But we've got to know, number one, that we are loved on the inside of our hearts so that we don't walk around with an orphan mindset. This is why we're less likely to forgive someone else. After all, if we can do it, why can't they? They don't need my forgiveness. Just do the right thing. But self-sufficiency is the opposite of what God wants from us. He wants us dependent upon him because believe it or not, he is enough for us. He's enough for us. There's a moment where Jesus is having a final big moment with his disciples. Let me tell you the like, backstory of this. So, so the disciples have gone through a ride with Jesus. I mean, they have they watched this miracle man do these incredible things and teach them amazing things about God and call himself the son of God and all these, all these things that were just revolutionary in the moment. Then they, they come to the cross and Jesus dies. And for three days, for three days, I mean, the disciples were despairing. They were up in an upper room by themselves, just crying and wailing and worrying about what's going to happen next. Are we gonna be the next guys who are hung on a cross? We really blew it following this Jesus. And then three days later, he rises from the dead. And then right after that, he goes and he starts talking to people. It's crazy. When you read the Bible, 
in the early, early, early Christians that it's, that it's talking to, the letters to the Christians in the first century, it doesn't say, hey, just trust him by faith. They say, hey, go talk to so-and-so who saw him after his resurrection. And he can tell you about what happened with Jesus of Nazareth. It was incredible. Jesus didn't just like show himself to the 12 disciples. He showed himself to hundreds and hundreds of people. In fact, at one point, he showed himself to 500 people gathered together. They all were witnesses of this. So it wasn't like people in the first century were looking around going, I wonder if this happened. They were going, it happened. Because many, 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 many eyewitnesses. And now Jesus has gathered them together for one last time. And he's like, hey guys, I'm leaving. And they're like, wait, what do you mean? What do you mean? Because we didn't know that you were going to die when you said you were going to leave us the first time. What do you mean now? He's like, I'm going to go and be with my father. And I'm going to send you someone. In fact, it's better for me to go than to stay. And I don't know about you, but I think we all would probably agree on this. Watching him walk around, perform miracles, watching him raised from the, de- raised from the dead, watching him show himself to person after person after person. And he says he wants to leave and it's going to be better. Ah, uh-uh. No. Like, I want you to stay. Like, I'm invested. My whole life has been about you, Jesus, now. He's like, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go to be with my Father in heaven. And he ascends. He says, I'm gonna send you someone, the Holy Spirit. He's gonna be a counselor, a wise advocate, in here to remind you of all the things I've taught you and to teach you all things in me. And you have that as a follower of, of Christ. That is the inheritance of being a Christian. You have God that reigns and rules in your heart every single day. He is with you even now. And and, and John 14, 18, Jesus says, these are some of the last words he says to them. I will not leave you as orphans. I will not leave you as orphans. You're not on your own. I am with you to the end of the age, he said. I'm with you forever. And you just have to trust that I will be with you for all the days. Colossians 3, 14 says this. And over all these virtues, the gentleness, the kindness, um, the humility, the patience, these vir- after all these virtues, put on love. And if you want to know how these things all work together, love is what binds them together. Love is, is what allows you to be a gentle and kind and humble and patient person. Your motivation for why you do what you do matters. If you are just bearing with someone because you can't stand them, that's a, way different, that's a way different circumstance than choosing to love them and engage with them. And he's like, I want you to bind all of these things together in love. And here's how this whole thing ends. In verse 15, he says this, I want you to let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and be thankful. So let's, let's talk about this. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Um, the peace of Christ as a Christian already exists in your heart. You might think, well, I don't know. I don't feel peaceful. I feel anxious, worried, scared, upset all the time. He's like, no, no. The the peace of Christ does dwell inside of you. He says, I need you to let it rule. I need you to let it reign. I need you to let it take control. And I'll tell you the way in which this has worked for me because I went from being a person who was extremely controlling and trying to figure out like, how do I manage my life? I'm on my own to being a person who walks by faith as best as I possibly can. And it had to do with the last part of that, and be grateful. About seven or eight years ago, a guy, a friend of mine came to me, and he said, Mike, the church is going really well. Uh, God's working in your family. You you have power in the pulpit. You've got all these great things. And he said, he said, but you're not, you're not a thankful person. And it just cut me to the cart. And I was like, oh, So I went back and I examined my life and I was like, yeah, you're 100% right. Came back and said, I'm sorry. I I didn't mean to be that person. Just kind of evolved into that person, background, whatever, no excuses. And then I went to work. And I think you can't really pursue peace directly. Have you ever tried to be patient directly? You're just like, okay, now I'm gonna be patient. (laughs) It's the worst experience. If you haven't done it, try it, it's terrible. You'll realize I'm never patient, right? So, so I think peace is the same way. It's already in your hearts. To let it happen, you have to develop gratefulness in your life. And so here's what I said to the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm gonna work on this. And so one of the practical ways I did it, I set an alarm for every hour on the hour while I was awake. And all it said was, be grateful. And so I would constantly bring this back to myself all day long. And you know what happened at first? It wasn't successful. It wasn't. The, the alarm would go off and I would think to myself, I'm still in this stupid meeting Thank you, God, for meetings. You know, it was just, it did, it was like terrible. It was awful, right? 
And so, and so it took time for me to develop it because this is, this, is, this is taking the focus off of all the wrong things and placing the focus on all the right things, right? And so what I said to him was, Father, I'm gonna do my absolute best to thank you and to be grateful in places and spaces where no one else can see what they should be grateful for. When people take for granted certain things, God, I will point them out to you and say, thank you for these things in my life. Thank you for these things in someone else's life. And you absolutely can learn that discipline. It just takes time for you to develop it, but just constantly coming back to what you are grateful for. Every time you hear someone say something negative, look for what's positive in what they're saying. You know, I mean, I didn't like the meeting. I could have turned back around and been like, I'm having a meeting to advance the gospel, God. Thank you so much. It's how you look at it. It's how you see it. And once you start becoming grateful, the more and more grateful you become, the more and more peaceful your heart becomes. If you wanna let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, if you wanna love other people really, really well, then be a grateful person because people need that in their lives. You need that in your life. And that will make a huge difference. Amen? Amen.